Psalmist David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my tongue. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come on, Mississauga, oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. This poor man cried unto the Lord, and he did hear my cry. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man and the woman that put their trust in him. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I wish there were one or two people in this place who would be willing to shout hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him on the timbrel. Praise him on the string instruments. Praise him with your voice. I wish somebody would open their mouth and declare, good is the Lord, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised from the rising of the sun until the setting of the same. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. 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 In reverence for the scriptures, I invite you to stand to your feet. We'll be reading the word of God together as it is found in the book of Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14 and we'll read verse five through 15. On the screen is the New Life version. If you have a print of the Bible, a physical copy, please feel free to continue to follow in the version of your choice on the screen is the New Life version. And it says this, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had left, Pharaoh and his servants changed their minds about the people. They said, what is this we have done? We have let Israel go from working for us. And so he made his war wagon ready and took his people with him. He took 600, how many? Of the best war wagons and all the other war wagons of Egypt in the care of leaders. Where it goes on to say, the Lord made the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, hard. And Pharaoh went to catch the people of Israel who were leaving without fear. The Egyptians followed them with all the horses and war wagons of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they came to them at their tents by the sea, beside a place on the east border of Egypt, in front of Baal Zaphon. He goes on to say, but Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, be strong, and see how the Lord will save you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and all you have to do is keep still. Could you read this last verse with me? It says, then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to keep going. I speak to you for a few moments under the caption, don't stop, keep going. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, our Savior, our King, we thank you for your word. You've been with me in my study. Pray that you will bless this delivery to the hearts of your people. Speak to me, speak through me, and speak to your people. May they receive your word. May it set them on higher ground. For we pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
As you take your seats, I have some unfinished business. A couple of weeks or months ago, we had a revival in this place and I had a gift to distribute to a able young person, a youth. And so this morning, I still have that gift in my office. I'm gonna ask one of the deacons to get it for us. But this morning, I'm going to ask for your listening ear if you're between the ages of 13 through 21, and there may be spe something special in store for you at the end of the word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't stop, keep going. Had the opportunity to go along with the Mississauga Pathfinders on a hike through the Credit Valley River. In that gorge, down in the city of Mississauga in this area. And we hiked alongside the winding river. At that time of the year, there is a certain fish that is bountiful in the river. It's called salmon, river salmon. They have an unrelenting drive to get to a destination, to get upstream for the propagation of the species. If they don't make it upstream, then the entire species is at risk of extinction. They know that for the continuation of their kind, they must swim against the current, against the tide, to get to the eggs for fertilization. If they fail to do that, the entire species is at risk of extinction. With that said, I'd like to say it's disappointing for people who have set out on a journey to stop, to quit, to give up, to give in, to lose sight of the vision before they arrive at their destination. Most, if not all of us, can relate to having quit something in our lives. Some of you should be able to come up here and play the piano because your parents spent thousands of dollars in piano lessons, but you quit too early. Do I have a witness in the house? Some of you should play the guitar, but you quit. And as a result, you've lost out on that Levitical calling to play the instruments in the house of God. Some of you could have been at the top of your career. If you hadn't stopped by now, you would have been a CEO. If you hadn't stopped by now, you would have had your doctorate. If you hadn't stopped by now, you would have finished high school. And so it's a disappointing and unfulfilling thing for the people of God to set out on a journey, on a mission, but not come to the destination. One of the challenges which has hindered the fulfillment of the potential of the people of African descent in the Western world is that in many ways, hear me somebody, we have not continued on the journey to liberty and emancipation for which our ancestors and former generations set out. The truth is we would have been so much further along, much further along economically, educationally, and even spiritually if we continued with the same fervor and energy with which our parents started. They had a vision. They started out on a journey. And like Moses, they were only able to glimpse the promised land from afar. But I'd like to suggest to you that their dying wish was for us to continue the work which they started to build on that legacy with the same fervor, the same zeal, the same urgency, the same enthusiasm with my senior would say the same vim, vigor and vitality that they set out on the journey with. In 1834, the fullness of time had come for the people of African descent. And so similar to the experience of the Israelites in Egypt for 400 years, in 1834, the time had now come for emancipation and liberation. And so on August 1st, 1834, there was a declaration of, of emancipation that freed all the enslaved people across the Caribbean, across Africa, South America, as well as even in Canada. In December, 30 years later of 1865, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States because God had said, enough is enough. But still, colonial powers continued oppressive practices like segregation and Jim Crow law and colorism. 
And so by about the mid 20th century, in the 1950s and 60s, you will recall Ella Martin, there were some key figures who led a revolution, a charge against oppression. In North America, there was the great civil rights movement under the leadership of Dr. King. In the Caribbean colonized Africa, there was a great movement of nationalism. As the people of the territories of the British, the French, and the Spanish sought their own sovereignty and identity outside of colonialism, they sought independence to stand in their own national identity, to be their own people with their own anthems, their own flag, and their own government. But hear me, where we stand today, the challenge to our present progress is that as we lose many of the figures who led the charge of independence and decolonization and liberty, we have not continued in many ways on the journey which they set out. Nelson Mandela set out on a journey. Bob Marley set out on a journey. Thurgood Marshall and MLK Jr. Be it through lack of succession planning or lack of vision and where there is no vision, the people, or that younger generations, maybe we drop the baton. But in many ways, we have not continued on their journey with the same vigor, urgency, and determination in which our parents did. And so often when a movement loses its leader, the drive and the impetus dies with the absence of the leader. But hear me, saints of God, if the movement and the people know that they are led not by any human figure, but by a higher power, bigger than any pastor, any politician, any prince, any premier, or any president, then they will continue to progress and hold their leaders accountable. They will not stop. They will keep going. If our people know that Jesus is the captain of the ship and that with Christ in the vessel you can smile at the storm, if they know that no matter what storm cloud may rock this ship of mine, the light of my Savior will lead me safely through the night. Though my ship may be rocky and my sails may be torn, I shall rest in the eye of the storm. If our people know that Jesus is the captain of our ship, the work of liberation which Harriet Tubman did in guiding those who desired and were bold enough to seek and chase freedom in the territories of the North and, and Canada. If our people know that the diplomatic yet relentless work of Dr. King and the civil rights movement and the excellent artistry of Maya Angelou and Claude McKay and Sidney Poitier and the global impact of Nelson Mandela and the educational elevation of Marcus Garvey, if they knew that we were not to stop, we would not stop. And so the work of liberation and progress with some of these celebrated figures and acclaimed heroes of the black community had begun and left unfinished after having fallen to uh, victims to death and martyrdom and self-sacrifice is for us to continue. It is unfinished business. So we've got some work to do. Permit me to apply this to our context. There were some pioneers who started a mission. They had a vision the Advent Gospel to all the world in my generation, the C.D. Brooks and the E.E. E. Cleveland and the Charles Bradford and the Walter Pearson, they preached a gospel to my generation, but the time has come for this generation to preach to my generation. And so in our local church, the dedicated and passionate work of a Russell Lambert and a Una Kent and a Sarah Homer, God rest her soul, and a Narvella Centilera, Curtin Bunty Noel and Edmund Prescott and so many others, they set out on a journey and we must build on the legacy which they left. Their intention was for those of us who follow behind them to continue until the day of Christ. It was not their intention for us to become comfortable, to fall into complacency, to settle into contentment. It was not their intention for us to settle in mediocrity. It was their vision for us to continue to forge forward because their mission was don't stop. Keep going.
There's an old adage that says hard times create strong men. And strong men create good times. And good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. And so I ask you, Saga, where are we in this cycle? What is the destination to which we aspire? For ourselves to come to the realiz realization that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that every brown-skinned girl would know your skin just, is just like pearls, and that the kink in your crown is no reason to frown, that your God-given full lips and curvy hips is a gift from the Creator, that every dark-skinned boy in this place would recognize that you are more than muscle and brawn, that you can be an engineer and a lawyer and doctor, and while it's good to play basketball, you can be anything you want in this world that you are intelligent and sufficient, a son of the king, that you are worthy of respect and favor. Amen. Amen. It should be our goal and mission for everyone to know that we are not judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character, that all people will know that we are purchased with the blood of Christ, and as such we are loved by the Most High, that we are dignified and a royal priesthood. So as we consider the themes of liberty, progress, and legacy, it brings me to the word of God in Exodus chapter 14. The children of Israel had begun on their journey to liberty. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh, refused to release God's people. And the Bible says that the Egyptians were struck with how many plagues? Come on, saints. Flies, frogs, locusts, boils, and finally the death of the firstborn son. And Pharaoh, in his grief-stricken state, pays no attention to the exodus of Israel out of Egypt. But Pharaoh comes to his senses and realizes that he has lost the economic driving force of free labor. Hmm, you'd be amazed what free labor can do for an institution. You'd be amazed what free labor could do for a country. Hmm. You ought to know that these countries in which we dwell was built on the back of immigrants and free labor. And so the formidable United States that you now visit from time to time and this land on nat this country on native land was built on the back of immigrants and free labor. I wish to remind some immigrants in the house that let nobody despise you because you're from another country. These countries of the new world would be nothing without the hardworking efforts of underpaid and undercompensated contributions of people who have come from other lands. So let nobody despise you because you have an accent. The Western world, and particularly the, the Americas, was built on the backs of you and me. And so the economic impact of free labor is immeasurable. As a matter of fact, history tells us that the Egyptian dynasties crumbled and significantly withered Immediately after, according to what the word of God tells us, if you check the history books, you will find that the Egyptian dynasties crumbled after the exodus of God's people. Hmm, the Bible ain't never lied yet. So the word tells us that Pharaoh in his frustration made his chariot ready and he took the best of his army. He took his high guard and, and, and he went out to seek and find uh, those people of God who had begun on their journey to liberty. The word says, Pharaoh king of Egypt, his heart, his heart hardened, went to catch the people of Israel who were leaving without fear. The Egyptians followed them with all the horror all the horses and war wagons of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they came to them at the tents by the sea. The people of God had left the, 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 the land of Egypt and they had continued on a journey, but came to a place where they had to set up tent. They had to stop for a campground. And I'm, allow me to build a, a little tent in this sermonic moment. If you could put on the screen, you will see 
a map of the journey of the, the, the children of Israel. And I, I brought my laser, I hope it works. Allow me to teach for just a couple of minutes. The word of God tells us that the people of God leave, ex, leave Egypt and they go through the wilderness. But you'll follow that green line. Can you see that laser? Can you see it? They follow this green line and they come around the mountains on the shores in the wilderness and they get up to that red dot at Etham day 16. They set up camp there and behind them is a mountain. They are stuck. Beside them is Pharaoh and his army. And before them is the Red Sea. Behind them is what? Beside them is who? And before them is what? The Red Sea. Build a tent here. Mark the spot. We'll come back to this. I want to say that every Israelite has a Pharaoh. Every Israelite has a Red Sea. And every Israelite has a mountain behind them. Likewise, it is in our personal lives that when you make up your mind that you're going to serve God, Pharaoh rises up against you. When you're done with this situation, when you're done with this one-sided abusive relationship, some Pharaoh is going to rise up and try to reclaim you. When you're going to serve God, when you've made up your mind and you'll go into the baptismal grave of, of, of water and come up into new life, some Pharaoh is going to come and try to reclaim you for the kingdom of the enemy. But you're going to follow God's plan. You're going to follow God's map. You're going to get baptized nonetheless because believe it, God is bigger than your Pharaoh. The word says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And so I'd like to tell the people of God that when you set out on a God-given mission, on a, with a God-given destination, you've got to keep going, don't stop. You've got to don't stop and keep going. The Bible says it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh, one of his servants, was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? Why have we let the Israelite people go from serving us? And so the people find themselves in this place called Pihakirath. That is that place on the red dot. A place that is east of the border of Egypt. They're in a rock. Between a rock and a hard place. The Bible says, when Pharaoh came near, the people of Israel looked and saw the Egyptians coming after them. And they were filled with fear. Filled with what? Fear. And cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, Pastor, is it because there was no grave in Egypt that you have taken us to die in this desert? Why have you taken us into this fellowship hall? We had a lovely sanctuary. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us to wither away in this desert? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Did we not tell you in Egypt to leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here. I'd like somebody to know that if you stay in mediocrity, you are going to die. Sometimes a small measure of freedom, a small measure of progress and privilege causes us to forget that we are coming from where we are coming from and lose sight of where we want to be. But I've stopped by to tell you in this holy cathedral on this blessed Sabbath morning that sometimes we get a glimpse, a foretaste of a blessing and we abandon the entirety of it for a portion of it. But you need to don't stop, keep Hmm. My mom used to say, if you do your homework, if you eat your porridge, then you can watch some TV. Don't abandon the destination for a rest stop. 
I'd like to say to Saga that we've got so much further to go. Don't stop now. Pharaoh was advancing towards them, and sometimes God allows us to go into a place where we can't weasel our way out, we can't finesse our way out. We've got to trust and obey him and rely on his strength. And so God's people had found themselves literally between a rock and a hard place on the side of a mountain. Before them was the? Behind them was the? And beside them was? Pharaoh and his army. And so what do you do when you find yourself between a rock and a hard place? What do you do when your back's against the wall? To whom do you turn when you need help? Where do you go when there's nowhere to go? Well, the psychologists and the sociologists would tell you that there are three responses to tragedy. How many? In a crisis, some people will freeze. Their joints lock up, their knees buckle, and they lose their breath. Another type of person will fight. I may look like a small guy, but this is my type of person. I'm gonna fight. My fists will clench, and I'll assume a defensive posture. Some people, like my dear wife, she's a flight type of girl. She says, deuces, see you later, alligator. I'm out of here. Hasta la vista, and au revoir, and bye-bye. But well, the people of God ought to know that when you find that your back's against the wall, you can call on the name of Jesus. There is a name that is higher than all names. That name is Jesus. Solomon says the name of the Lord is a strong tower, Woo! Strong tower and the righteous run into it and are what? Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and our strength. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. He says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And so if God be for us, who can be against us? Paul says, at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The songwriter says, there's a name I love to hear. I love to sing its words. It sounds like music in my ear. It's the sweetest name on earth. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the sweetest name. I know there is something about the name of Jesus. Master, he's a savior. Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain, kings and kingdoms will vanish away. But the name of God, God will remain. And so you ought to know that when you find yourself between a rock and a hard place, you can call on the name Jesus. I wish one or two people in this place would just say Jesus. So when Pharaoh came near, the people of Israel looked and saw the Egyptians coming after them. They were filled with fear and cried out to the Lord. He said, Moses, why did you bring us here? And I'd like to say to Mississauga that this juncture is a camping spot, not your final destination. Israel was outside the grasp of the Egyptians physically, but mentally, it seems many of them were still held by their captives. The greatest emancipation is not of the body, but it, it is of the mind. And the greatest hindrance to our progress, our liberty, and our identity, claiming or God-given identity and image in Christ is an attachment to a toxic situation, a destructive relationship, just because we've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> and so he says, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to die in Egypt. Somebody ought to know that they ought not to be in bed with Egyptians. Have you ever been in a relationship and you know this person will be the death of you, but for some reason you just won't let go? Sometimes we find ourselves in a debacle, in a, debacle, in a what's her name? Entanglement. With the enemy that though it's killing us, it's killing your spiritual life, but you remain. Saints, it's time to move forward. Sometimes God people become so attached to Egypt that we would rather die at the hand of Egyptians than seek refuge in the arms of God. And so Egypt, I'd like to 
to, to announce that Egypt is a slavish attachment to tradition. The attachment to the way we've always done it, even when it's not working. Egypt is the enslavement that we know and the inability to embrace the new thing that God wants to do in you and through you and for you. Egypt will be the death of us. And so it's time to let go Egypt. It's time to don't stop. Keep going. But there are a few challenges to moving forward. Sometimes we are so enveloped in the mistakes of the past. There are some things we didn't do right. Yes, there are some things we didn't do well. But stop dwelling on the past and move forward. I thank God. I thank God that we have a few people who are willing to die for the cause of liberty and justice rather than remain in the Egypt of captivity. So there's an old melody which is familiar to us. You may know it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. It precedes Western civilization. What do I mean? The melody of Amazing Grace is built on the black keys of the piano. It's called the pentatonic scale. It's five pitches. And, and the, the pentatonic scale predates our colonization and slavery. You see, the Eastern people, they know the pen, pentatonic scale. And they were able to con construct these melodies. And so you'll find that almost every Negro spiritual can be built on the black keys of the piano. There was a man by the name of, of Newton, John Newton. He was an Englishman. And, and he, 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 he ended up working a slave ship. And, and he found that as he worked the slave ship, he was hearing the crying lament of the people that were in chains in the belly of that ship. And he took those melodies and he put to the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You see, those laments were the lament of people who were found in captive, but they would throw themselves off the ship through the Atlantic Ocean. They would rather die than to live captive. There are many of us who would rather stay in captivity of Egypt than live free. Many of whom would rather die at sea, martyr themselves, than live enslaved. And Mrs. Saga, it's time for us to rid ourselves of the captivity of the past, to not stop, but to... There is uncharted, undiscovered, and unconquered territory for us to exp explore. Every child of God has an Egypt to abandon, a Red Sea to cross, and a promised land to claim. Mm -mm. You didn't get that. Every child of God has an Egypt to abandon, a Red Sea to cross, and a promised land to claim. I'd like to say to this church, to this body of believers on this day, that our full potential has not yet been realized. And so you ought not to stop now. You must keep. Now is not the time to lose hope. Now is not the time to fall by the wayside. Now is not the time to forget why we started. Now is not the time why we ought to forget where we built this place at 2250 Credit Valley Road. Now is the time to... Now is not the time to throw in the towel. As a matter of fact, now is the time to tighten your belt, to tie your shoestrings, and to ready yourself for where God is about to take this place next. Now is the time to keep your loins girded and your lamps trimmed and burning and to be like wise men waiting for the return of their Savior. Because Paul says, knowing the time, if we know the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So let me push it. Present leaders, pastor, elders, the people came to them, came to Moses and said, why, why, why did you bring us here? And Moses turns to God and says, the people are crying, Lord. Sometimes the people will complain. When the people come to complain, you turn to God. 
and God will have a response for you. The word of God says that God tells Moses, tell the people of Israel to keep going. Every leader who is visionary and progressive will experience the exhaustion of leading people through difficult times and through changing times. And sometimes when the weight of the crown weighs heavy on your head, you will want to tell the folks to go somewhere. Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am a people of, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So Pastor Ewan, sometimes you will say, woe is me. Elder Carl, Elder Sherry, sometimes you'll say, woe is me. Elder Opal, Elder Howard, Elder's team, all ministry leaders, sometimes you will say, woe is me, for I am a person of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. But God says that you are to tell the people, don't stop. We know the saints complain. We know they murmur and bicker. And sometimes it will feel like you want to pull your hair out. But God says, tell the people. Mrs. Saga, we have come so far, 50 years, done so much, achieved so much, changed so much, but don't stop now. You've got so much more to go, so much further to go. Over the last couple of years, we've achieved so much, made so much progress. I'd like to see the community service team keep going to increase our community presence. I'd like to see our media ministry keep going. I'd like for us to continue our infrastructural and facilities development. I'd like to see us continue learning and, and, and grow intellectually. We survived a pandemic. We've sold one property, built another. We've added a gym, a fellowship hall, a hall, and we've even renovated a sanctuary. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. But don't stop. Keep going. We can't stop now. There's so much work to do. We must, stop, must not stop until this city knows our name, what we stand for, and what we represent. Slow down. Slow down, guys. Slow down. I'm not ready yet. I'm taking my time today. Slow down. Slow down. Until this city knows our God and the might and power of our God. Don't stop. Keep going. There are three ingredients to keep going. How many? Three. Write them down. Text it, tweet it, take it down. The first is this. The first ingredient is that we ought to protest every Egypt. A defiance to the oppressive control, the defiance to the imposition of every pharaoh, a, a righteous indignation, a fearlessness with which we will stand up to every advance of the enemy. A holy rebellion to every resemblance of Egypt and Babylon. Allow me to remind you, Seventh-day Adventists, that we are Protestants. Our identity is formed in protest to Babylon. And so we have a God-given responsibility to protest any Egypt. We must protest any spirit of complacency, indifference, and mediocrity. It must not take residence in our camp. We've got to commit ourselves to excellence, quality, and God-given dignity. Protest every Egypt. Number two is pray across every Red Sea. The word of God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. I wish there were one or two people in this house who believe the, effort, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man does avail much. We ought to pray through it. Pray through your Red Sea. When we encounter Red Seas, you go on your knees and call on the name of Jesus. And number three is we need to praise and claim every promised land. Praise, you ought to know, confuses and confounds the enemy. 
praise lays claim of what God has prepared for us before we even see it or take hold of it. And so we are to pray, praise God before we see the fruition of what God has told us is in the future for us. Praise give God, gives God the glory which he is worthy and deserving of. Praise says God is bigger than the mountain behind me. God is bigger than the Red Sea ahead of me. And my God is bigger than Pharaoh and his army beside me. If God be for us. Who can be against us? And so Paul says, press towards the mark of the high calling. Paul says, we have this confidence that he'll finish what he started. We've got to unite the wisdom of the elders, the experience of the elders. Hear me on that side, saints. Along with the energy and the strength of the youth, working together in harmony until this city knows the name Mississauga 7th. I'm tired of talking to people in the city today. Ask me, where's your church? I want the church to be a reference point for the hospital, not the other way around. Until this city knows our name, we've got unfinished business. So you ought to keep going. And what would you do if you knew that victory was assured. If we knew that success was assured, you wouldn't stop. You'd keep going. Now I'm gonna close. <laughs> As we move to our close, Canada is a beautiful country. As a matter of fact, probably the most beautiful place I've been in the world it's right here in this country. Last summer, I had the opportunity to go to Alberta and visit the town called Banff. And I found the most beautiful place in the world. We were hiking, Ven and I, hiking on that trail, going up to Banff and we looked up the, the location on Google Maps. Go to a new city, we try to look up attractions, do the touristy things. As we looked for it, it told us of this trail that had a beautiful waterfall at the end of the trail. But we thought the trail would be about 15, 20 minutes. Here we were, an hour in, not yet at the destination. We kept going. But as we go, as we went forward, we would ask other tourists who were coming down from the mountain, what is at the end and how long will it take us? Some of us are asking, how long will it take us? How Lord, Lord, how long, Lord, how long? We've been hearing these messages over and over. How much longer, how much further? But their response would always be, don't stop, keep going. And so we were an hour and a half in, asking questions, how much longer? The response was, keep going. We got to the destination after over two hours. But what we found is that the difficulty of the journey makes sweeter the arrival of the destination. Hmm. The difficulty of the journey makes sweeter the arrival of the destination. Paul says, I count myself not to apprehend it, but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forth unto those things which are before me. I press toward the mark of the price of the high calling in Jesus and to ensure as many people as possible are secured in that great day. And so community services, or Sister Darnell, don't stop, keep going. Tender mercies and touch of love. Don't stop feeding the homeless down in Toronto on Sunday mornings. 
Don't stop. Mississauga Pathfinders, don't stop. No matter how hard Uncle Greg pushes you, don't stop. Keep Acts 29 and Quest, where's Odney? Don't stop. Keep going. AV, Brother Mark and Brother Glenroy, don't stop. Keep going. Fight the good fight. So we will know that laid up for us is a crown in glory. And we can say, what, like Paul, I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the... And then laid up for me is a crown of righteousness that the Lord himself shall give me on that day. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind me, I press towards the mark of the high calling. We're marching to Zion. I'm pressing on the upward way. Don't stop. Keep going. Won't you turn to your neighbor and say, don't stop. Keep going. Don't stop. Keep going.